That was the opening few bars of Chopin's Etude in E major, opus 10, number 3. Before we play the piece, I'm, each piece, I'm going to pick them apart a little bit and maybe give you some insights as to why I think they're so awesome and also maybe how the composer has achieved the things that he's trying to in terms of the way they've been written. I want to give you a little bit of an insight into that opening of the Chopin. Uh, it's unbelievably beautiful, as I'm sure you can appreciate, but I think we often don't understand just how much of this incredible music is not random. It hasn't just been delivered from up on high into the composer's mind, uh, but it has a clear and obvious plan. Now, we're in E major, which means E is our starting note. And if I just play you this simple rising and falling scale, I'm sure you'll agree that while it's quite nice, it's not particularly remarkable. Big whoop, right? But what he's doing here is actually each of the long notes in the tune is the next note up in that scale, which means that the melody gets this feeling of constantly rising and striving and reaching level upon level. I'll show you what I mean accenting the main notes in the tune as we go. And then back we come down again. So he actually cheats a little bit at the top. And instead of going to the B, to the fifth note that we're expecting, he makes the music even more achingly beautiful by overreaching it. We're expecting this. And we get... Uh, which gives us that wonderful feeling of, um, of overreaching where we're heading. And then when he falls back to the B, it becomes a wonderful sense of release. And that's actually a device that Puccini uh, was incredibly liberal with the use of it's incredibly effective so look it's basically a rising and falling melody a rising and falling scale which is super simple but incredibly beautiful with those passing notes and the way it's been organized rhythmically there's some pretty cool stuff going on as well if we look at the left hand what he's doing is he's giving a little lean a little stress on the weak part of the beat That really helps us in the feeling of this music never having any vertical lines. I always think that a musical line very much is in conversation with, dialogue with, but often very opposed to the force of gravity. And the lines that move us most of all are the ones that seem to resist the desire to sink back down to earth. So there's all these little cool devices that composers who want to achieve that effect go to in order to make that happen. We're in two time here. That means that the first piece of the bar is quite a lot stronger than the second beat, normally. One, two, one, two. So what does he do in order to avoid all that verticality on beat one? He puts all the long important notes on the second beat of the bar, like this. I'm not going to be accenting it like that in performance, but the very fact that he's displacing where the stress goes gives us this unbelievable arc. So there's just a few ways that that opening uh, is composed in order to have this incredible effect on us. Now, this was actually one of Chopin's favourite melodies. Um, he even exclaimed when teaching it once, he threw his hands in the air and exclaimed, oh, such a beautiful melody, my fatherland. And of course, Chopin's relationship with Poland, his native Poland, was complicated and not the most easy. Him having left there at the age of 19, uh, never to return. He even carried a little pot around with him that contained some of Poland's soil um, and felt a great sense of longing and missing that country, most heard in his Polonaises and Mazurkas. And I think while the beginning is so tender, so beautiful, um, the middle section shows us just some of the stormy darkness that he was feeling as well. Now, on the piano we have the most pure interval is an octave, and that's when you play two identical notes, but one higher than the other. 
and that's so pure sounding because one is exactly twice the frequency of the other. But if we find the exact halfway point of that octave, we get this interval. It's called a tritone. And there was a time when it was known as the devil's interval because of how it split the octave in two and it sounded so dissonant. So if we build two of those tritones on top of each other, we get this chord, which is a diminished chord. And when Chopin wants to get dark and heavy handed in this piece, diminished chords come flying out of the traps. Once and then again. It's not just how dissonant the chord in itself is, it's the fact that they're all shifting up and down by tiny intervals, which means we're slaloming from wrenching harmony to wrenching harmony. And I think it's telling how in a, le in a lesser composer's hands, this beautiful tune at the beginning would have been very beautiful, would have sat there and the piece would have unfolded like that. But there's something about these great composers that are never content with just uh, a pretty tune. There has to be a bit more of a struggle. There has to be a bit more of a journey. And so after that moment, when we come back to the opening tune, we feel so much more gratitude for its presence than we did at the beginning. There's one more thing I want to share with you, which is a bit more personal about this piece. Um, I was not a particularly um, passionately musical child. Uh, I didn't have a, an amazing... Uh, delight in listening to music. I certainly didn't have an incredible desire to practice all day. I thank my dad very much for making that happen. Um, but there was some things that stick in my mind. And this is a piece that stayed in my mind without me realising it really, until I then found out actually what it was that I'd remembered all these years. And I remember sitting in our old living room upstairs and listening to a CD of Ad Ashkenazi playing all of these studies. And I don't remember a lot of it, but I remember this opening melody so clearly and there's one turn of harmony in a phrase at the end of the peaceful opening section where he builds to a big climax, we arrive on an E major chord and then he slides first to the minor, then to the major, which is also chord four at the time, and then back to chord one. And that is such a touching transition combined with the chord four to chord one, which is the chords we associate with an Amen in church. So it's so unbelievably heartbreakingly, heart meltingly peaceful. That has never, I've never forgotten that in my whole life. And it just, I just want to share it with you so you can pin your ears on it when it comes later in the piece. bereft of strength. Um, Marvellous piece. This is for Yvonne and Gemma. Thank you very much for your request. Uh, that, and this is to say to everyone, if you have requests, do fire them into me. And uh, I'm slowly working through the backlog, but it's lovely to have so much beautiful music to choose from and beautiful music to connect to people individually. And Gemma, we're thinking of you, especially in this difficult time for you. And we send all of our love yeah, we got a lovely little something from you in the post this morning. You are a total sweetheart. Uh, lots of love. Enjoy some beautiful Chopin. <laughs> 